All right, welcome to my very first biology YouTube lecture. Uh, this one's going to be on bacteria. I know that our PowerPoint is bacteria and viruses, but I'm going to break the work down into chunks. So we'll do bacteria, and then of course I know a lot of you will want to know quite a bit about viruses. We'll do that one later. So the first one is going to focus on bacteria. Now the setup of the screen, I have the whiteboard here. And I'll draw little diagrams and that on the whiteboard that go along with the work. But you can also see up in the corner here, I have the PowerPoint that you have online. So you can follow along. I'm going to put the same thing on here that I'm discussing on here. So hopefully that helps you out a lot. Um, so let's get into it. So bacteria, the basic info that we need to know about, about bacteria. Um, they're the first forms of life that were on the planet before any other living things were on this planet animals plants fungi bacteria were here first They rose out of the or organic soup of the primordial earth now primordial means Newly formed the ancient earth if we took could take a time machine and go back to the primordial earth uh, We'd be dead pretty quick. It was very hot. The atmosphere is dominated by carbon dioxide sulfur springs mega hurricanes, tons of volcanic activity, not nice, right? Very unsuitable for us. But for bacteria, they grabbed a foothold in this and they, uh, they eventually dominated the planet. Now, I know in class we had archaea bacteria, the old school bacteria, and U bacteria, the new school ones. These features are features that all bacteria have. So we know they are unicellular, single-celled, Prokaryotic, we went over this in class. It was one of the last things we did, what a prokaryotic cell was versus an, a eukaryotic cell. Their organelles are not membrane bound, which means they, they don't have a membrane around them, right? They have very few organelles. We talked about that as well. They, they don't have the ER, they don't have the Golgi, they don't have the lysosomes and all the stuff that we have inside of our cells. And they have a single circular chromosome. We have 46 linear pieces of DNA in each of our cells, body cells. They have a single circular piece of DNA that has all the genes necessary to be a bacteria and to run a bacteria life perfectly. They reproduce asexually through binary fission, which is a basically a simple form of mitosis, uh, asexual cell division. And of course, they make up both the archaea bacteria and eubacterial kingdoms. Uh, it used to be one. We talked about this in class because I'm old. We used to have monera, which was the kingdom that both of these were into. So we look at the basic structure of bacteria. Here's a picture of one here. We've got the DNA in the center of the cell. Now you can see this, so I won't point it out on this very small diagram. But you've got your DNA, your genetic material. You've got the cell wall, which protects very much like an animal plant cell wall. The cell membrane dictates what goes in and out. The cytoplasm, the interior fluid. The ribosomes, they have ribosomes. Now remember, ribosomes do not have a cell membrane, so they fit in here. They can be inside of a bacterial cell. Um, ribosomes, they build proteins. Obviously, proteins are the working molecules. The pili, these are going to be key later on. The pili are these little extensions all around the bacteria here, these little hair-like extensions. So we're going to use those. Remember those ones. And then the flagella coming off the tail end here for movement. Not all bacteria have them, but some do, so I included them. Now, bacterial shape. So pay attention here because we're actually going to find out, you know, when the doctor says you have strep throat or, or you know, streptobacillus and stuff like that, um, we're going to find out what that means right here. So there are three roots for shapes. There are cocci, which are spherical. Now, cocci bacteria are spherical, so they would be like, you know, like this. You'll see some of them on the back of your PowerPoint. Then we have bacilli, which are rod shaped. Bacilli would be like this guy here, or this guy here, or right here, right? Bacilli, kind of like hot dogs. They're like that. And then we have spirilla. Spirilla are like these little red ones that are running through the back of your PowerPoint here and here. They have kind of a spiral shape, right? So they look like that. So these are the three main shapes. Now there's prefixes that go along with these that kind of show the living arrangement. So when they take a bacterial culture or a throat swab from you, they look at how the bacteria are arranged. 
So if there's no prefix, it means they're living solitarily, single one by itself, right? If they say diplococcus, it means they're spherical and they're living in pairs. Diplobacillus, they're living in pairs and they're rod shaped. So you can kind of see how that works. Now here's one, you hear, you'll hear people say, oh, I got some uh, antibiotics from the doctor, I have strep throat, I had to stay home from school. Strep means that the bacteria are living in chains. So someone with strep throat might, if it's streptococcus, the bacteria, the bacteria are like this, living in a small group, right? They're still each an individual living cell, but they're in a chain like that. Or streptobacillus would be like that. So when they're looking at the bacteria, they're seeing these long chains. And that's what strep means. There can, you can also have a staph infection where they live in clusters. So a staph infection might look like this. If it's staphylococcus, they live in these little clusters like that. Right? You can see it on your PowerPoint here, a little cluster there and a little cluster here. Right? And that just means they're living in little groups. It's not a nice linear chain like this. It's like that. So staph, you can have staphylobacillus, staphylococcus. It just means staph means living in groups like that. So there are the shapes and the living arrangements there. Now, gram stain. Now, gram stain, it's a, it's a mixture of a, uh, two chemicals, crystal violet and iodine, and it reacts with the cell wall of certain bacteria, right? And that's why you'll hear about gram-positive bacteria. If the stain sticks to and adheres to the cell wall of the bacteria, it's gram-positive, right? Gram-positive bacteria are really common. And if you have a, a, a gram-positive bacterial infection, it tends to be the better one. You can kind of go, oh, okay, that's not a bad thing. Because usually, usually, not always, they're the less pathogenic, which means they don't cause disease like the gram-negative ones. The gram-negative ones, that's more of a negative thing. You can think about it that way. Gram-positive usually means a positive thing. Gram-negative, it's a bad thing. These ones, the gram stain doesn't react with the cell wall, but these ones tend to be the heavy hitters in terms of disease, right? Things like meningitis, an infection of the coating of the brain, gonorrhea, a sexually transmitted disease, and pneumonia, pneumonia which attacks the lungs, the wimpiest organs in the body, they're all caused by gram-negative bacteria. So, not a good thing. So we see some pictures here. Now, I wanted to put an example, I'm just going to erase my board. I wanted to put an example of a gram-positive bacteria that was actually bad, so we didn't think that all gram-positive were good. This is anthrax. Anthrax gets into the cerebral spinal fluid, which is the fluid that surrounds your brain and spinal cord, and it breaks it down. It breaks down the brain and spinal cord and eventually leads to your death. So that's an example of a gram-positive bacteria that's actually a bad thing. Most are okay. And here we can see, now of course it'll be larger on your computer, but here we can see some gram-negative bacteria, and these ones, excuse me one second, I got a cough. <clears throat> these ones, um, you can see, are, are light pinkish color. If we go back to the previous slide, or if you go back to that, it was very dark purple. These ones are very light pink. Now, how do these things gain their nutrition or, or eat? Some are autotrophic. In fact, the very first bacteria on the earth, the cyanobacteria, they had to be autotrophic. Obviously, the first things on the planet that you know, lived, had to be autotrophic. They ran photosynthesis to make their own energy because there was nothing else really to eat. So you couldn't go out and eat another living thing. There were no, no other living things. So photoautotrophs. Photo, getting back to our extensive Greek background or Latin background, photo means light. Auto means self and troph think of it as a trough like on a farm that's where animals feed right so an autotroph is a self feeder a photo autotroph like a tree or certain types of bacteria run photosynthesis they use light to make their own food and feed themselves some are chemo autotrophs they absorb little tiny chemicals and molecules around them and make larger uh, compounds with lots of energy to get them going some bacteria are heterotrophic. 
They have to eat stuff around them, like we do, right? We go and we eat plant and animal matter, and that's where we get our energy. So some bacteria do that, right? The ones that attack our body and make us sick often do this. They consume our cells and, and the, you know, the energy-rich compounds inside of our body. Some are symbiotic. They live in close association with the host, right? You have tons of E. coli in your digestive tract, right? There are more E. coli inside of your gut, your, your stomach and your intestines than there are people in our country. There's a billions of them in there. So, and they don't hurt you. In fact, they actually can help you because they're in there. Think of your body like a, a microbe hotel. All these E. coli have occupied all the rooms. When other things get in there sometimes, the E. coli say, no, 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 we're already here. Get lost. And so we don't get as sick as much. So they're symbiotic. It actually, they, they can help us in some ways. And some are parasitic. They get in there and they deplete our energy. They deplete our resources. And they can make us really sick, right? Perhaps even die. Other bacteria are saprobes. They eat on dead and decaying organic matter. So when animals die out in the woods or, you know, worms in the lawn die, these bacteria break them down. They break, you know, they're decomposers. They break down that. Or when animals poop or pee in the woods, these bacteria go in and they break that stuff down respiration some bacteria bacteria are anaerobic and what anaerobic means is that they don't use oxygen so anaerobic means no oxygen is used right this obviously obviously isn't us we need oxygen really badly we are aerobic we need O2, right? If we don't have oxygen, we die pretty quickly. So some bacteria are anaerobic, right? They don't require oxygen. Um, there are obligate anaerobes. Now, obligate, if you have an obligation, an obligation is something you must do, right? I have an obligation. I told, you know, I told my brother I was going to take him to his hockey game. Well, you have to do that, right? You told your parents, I have an obligation, guys. I got to head out early, right? So an obligate aero, anaerobe, sorry, obligate anaerobe means it must have no oxygen around it. It has to live somewhere on this planet where there's no oxygen whatsoever. If oxygen is around it, it's toxic, which seems weird because we need it to live so badly. But to them, it's the exact opposite. It kills them. So they can't have it. They have an obligation. They must have no oxygen around them. And then there are facultative anaerobes. These ones, again, they're anaerobes, so there's no oxygen being used. But facultative means if it's around, I can handle it. I just won't use it. So if you had facultative anaerobes on your kitchen table and, you know, they wouldn't die. They just sit there and they, they wouldn't use the oxygen the same way you do. So they could be around no problem. And then there are the aerobic bacteria. The aerobic need oxygen, just like we do to make ATP and energy-rich compounds. And if you're an aerobe, it means automatically you're an obligate aerobe, right? Because aerobe means need oxygen. You take the oxygen away, you're dead. So every aerobe is an obligate aerobe. They need it. Now, reproduction. Binary fission is one of the ways that we reproduce. If you remember when we did cell division, we talked about, excuse me, <clears throat> we talked about um, asexual ways of reproducing. Binary fission was one of those ways. So bacteria reproduce through binary fission. So you can see here, here's our bacterial cell right here. That green thing is a circular piece of DNA. It starts to pull apart and rebuild the other side, just like ours, semi-conservative, right? Semi-conservative DNA replication. It pulls apart, rebuilds the other side, and then we have two copies, two rings. Those two rings will be separated, and eventually the cell wall and cell membrane will pinch in, something very similar to cytokinesis that we do. And then we have our two bacterial cells here. So it's very similar to mitosis. Double up that DNA, have it in the middle, pull it apart, pinch it in, separate the cells. We've seen this before. Now, 
Remember before when I said the pili are going to do something very, very interesting for us? This is it. So disease is a big topic right now, obviously, with the coronavirus. But disease is caused by bacteria as well. And one of the things we don't want bacteria to do is conjugation. If you remember, genetic variation is a good thing because it helps you survive. Well, we don't want all bacteria to survive. Some of it makes us very, very sick. So here we see two bacterial cells. Now, if I were to draw one bacterial cell, here's bacteria A. It's got its regular DNA chromosome here, and then it's got this little circular bonus piece of DNA, and we've talked about these before. This is a plasmid, right? This is the regular circular piece of DNA. All a bacteria needs to live is this. This is bonus DNA, the plasmid. And the reason it's bonus DNA is it has resistance genes inside of it. Resistance genes help the bacteria resist certain environmental conditions that are placed upon it that might kill it. So for example, it might be an antibiotic that is commonly used, penicillin. There might be a penicillin resistance gene in here. So if this bacteria is inside of your body and you take penicillin, it's not killing this bacteria, right? We've got our other bacteria here. And of course it's living, so it has its regular DNA. Now, if you took penicillin and had this bacteria, we'll call it B, bacteria B is inside of you, it will kill bacteria B. No problem. All right? There's no gene for penicillin resistance here, but there is in this little plasmid. So those pili, the pili that we mentioned before, they'll actually connect between the two bacteria. So the pili will form something called a conjugation tube. This is made by the pili, those little hair-like projections we saw on the outside of the bacteria. And what happens is this plasmid, well, you can see it here in the diagram, it splits in half. Remember, this is made of DNA as well. It's bonus DNA. Half of that goes in here. And then the bacteria rebuilds the other half. Right? And then this other half will be built here. So now we've got a copy of the plasmid in both bacteria. Right? And there's different resistances. Tetracycline, penicillin, ampicillin, vancomycin, um, even other environmental factors like heat resistance. All right? So if you get a fever and try to cook the bacteria out of your body, and they have heat resistance, they're just laughing, going, look, this guy's running up his temperature for what reason? I'm loving it. All right? It's like a summer vacation. And all they have to do is connect for a brief moment. That'd be like me having a special ability right, to fly. I shake your hand, and now you can fly. You go shake someone else's hand, and you can fly. Or maybe I have the special ability to fly, and I shake someone's hand, and they have the ability to shoot red lasers out of their eyes. So now I can fly, and I have red lasers that I can shoot out of my eyes. I shake someone else's hand. This happens again, and now I have super strength. So now I become this super bacteria, right? And there's a type of bacteria called C. difficile. C is for Clostridium, it's a genera or a genus of bacteria. Difficile is French for hard or difficult to deal with. C. difficile is one of these super bugs that we talk about. C. difficile has gone around shaking hands with several different bacteria and gotten several of these plasmids inside of it. And now because of all these gained multiple resistances, it's very difficult or hard to kill. And so that's something we want to avoid. If you have a bad bacterial infection in the hospital, and it's the same thing they're doing now with the people that have the virus, they will try to isolate you as best as possible. We can't have them around because you're coughing on your hands and you're sneezing, and then you go and you, you know, you go to use the bathroom. If you're in a joint room with someone that doesn't have the infection, and then they go to the bathroom after you, get it on their hands, and then, you know, happen to scratch their eye or, you know, have food after that, and they forgot to wash their hands, then they have it too. The bacteria can trade plasmids pretty easily and become pretty strong if we're not careful with it. So conjugation is something we definitely want to be careful of. Bacterial cryogenic chambers. Um, certain bacteria, I'll bring all these points up so I can get out of the way. Ooh, how do I go back? Oh, there you go. So certain bacteria 
can create things called endospores. Endospores are like cryogenic chambers. Now, cryogenic chambers are like what Austin Powers was in. If you remember the Austin Powers movies, Michael Myers, Canadian actor, became that British spy and he was frozen in time in a cryogenic chamber, right? When conditions become very unfavorable for bacteria, so it becomes very cold or very dry, right? Very arid, like some areas. Um, what some gram-positive bacteria can do is they can form endospores. And these are thick, round, uh, thick walls that surround them and protect them, right? And they go into this dormant phase. Dormant means they, they sleep, right? Like at university, you go to a dorm, that's where your room is, that's where you sleep. Dormir is the French verb to sleep. So they go dormant and they'll stay like that for weeks, months, perhaps even several months until the spring rolls around, the nicer weather, we get some rain, it's now the soil's moist, it's warm temperature, and boom, the endospore will crack open, the bacteria is back open for business. Bacterial kingdoms that we see, we have the archaea bacteria. These are the old school ones. They live in very harsh conditions. Remember that primordial earth we just talked about? Very, very difficult to deal with. So sulfur springs, deep ocean vents, volcanic rims, you'll find these guys in very harsh areas. So one type of archaea bacteria are methanogens. They release methane gas. This is something that we can't breathe in. In fact, this methane gas builds up. Uh, it used to build up in coal mines back where I'm from in Cape Breton. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gas that can ignite and it, it can, can explode. It's related to things like propane, your barbecue tank, butane and lighters. Methane is the same thing, right? So a spark from a, a pick or a shovel could cause an explosion. And men have died in the coal mines by hitting methane pockets caused by these bacteria breaking down, uh, well, fossil fuels, right? Thermophiles. Thermo means heat, right? Thermo is heat. A thermometer measures heat. A thermos keeps your stuff hot. So this is heat. And file means lover of, right? So a thermophile is a lover of heat. Volcanic rims, um, hot springs, places like that, which, you know, normally most animals and plants and stuff can't even go near. These guys are sitting there loving it, right? Um, so thermo, you heard file, it's a terrible example, but if you think of the word pedophile, PD is child, file is lover of, and that's why a pedophile is called a pedophile. But that's, again, the etymology of the word. I want us to know what the words actually mean. And then there's halophiles. Again, halo comes from halogens. A lot of our halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, they're used in salts. So these things are found in salt springs. If you ever see where they test those cars down in the salt flats in Utah, right? There's no animals or plants around. That used to be a big inland ocean. All the salt is still in the soil. So lots of things can't live there, but these guys, they thrive there, right? Again, those ancient areas that most things go, oh, count me out, dude, I can't handle that. These guys are loving it. Then you have the eubacteria. These are found pretty much everywhere on Earth, except for these few really primordial places, right? They show a great deal of diversity because you think, well, there's jungles and there's forests and meadows and oceans and all of that. So they're all over the place. Bacteria are literally everywhere. That brings us to the end of the video because viruses, which I know is the hot topic right now, and it's the reason we're making these videos, viruses will cover in a future lecture. The next YouTube lecture for biology is gonna be on these guys. And uh, I know you're dying to get in that, and we will get into that. Anyway, thank you for watching, and um, hope you learned a few things. Um, you can leave some comments in the uh, comment section below the video, or you can get through, through to me on Edsby if you have any comments. Um, and that's it. Anyway, I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.